What's up YouTube, Del here from Zephyr, and today I am bringing you an update for one of my favorite decks, and that is of course, Dark Worlds. So it's been a couple of months since I've updated this deck, and a lot of people have been asking me the question, how do we deal with the mold chummies and everything else running around? Well, quite simply, with Dark Worlds, you aim to deck them out. Yes, of course, you do have that ability to go through your opponent's hand with stuff like talents to try and make them put cards back with a form of silver, but you would pretty much shift up your strategy and just go, you know what? I'm gonna be able to special summon from the deck quite a lot. I'm gonna be able to special summon from the hand quite a lot and the extra deck quite a lot, I might as well try to deck you out. Now, of course, that is not going to be an absolute guaranteed winner for you, but it just gives you an option that can really put the fear in your opponent of, oh no, uh, they're actually going to summon a huge amount of times, which this deck can do very easily. There are also a lot of hand traps around, stuff like D-Shifter, which will be an issue for the deck, but you need to kind of take that with a pinch of salt, as that's when your side deck is going to become even more important, and you can start playing Floodgate-style cards like Eradicator Virus, you can even start playing cards that are a little bit more control-orientated, or of course you can just very easily swap into Crossout Designator, control your opponent that way, and then continue to OTK, as the best thing about a Dark World deck is it has a lot of aggression behind it and a lot of gas. So without that out of the way, please smash that like button, hit that notification bell, and subscribe so you don't miss out on any more upcoming content. As a disclaimer, this does involve the Fiendsmith engine, as I thought I would put together the most competitive version I could possibly uh, kind of conjure together. Yes, of course, you can play the deck without the Fiendsmiths, but the reason I've added it in is it just adds a little bit more synergy, and it gives it a little bit more gas, just so you can keep going and going and going and going. Obviously, the biggest downside is with the Fiends with Engine, it does still falter to stuff like D-Shifter and the same hand traps that the deck already struggles against. However, what it will give you is it gives you that capability of taking that engine out for the side deck for the counters to those matchups. And if you are in a matchup where stuff like D-Shifter is not prominent in that match, you'll be able to use the Fiendsmiths to just keep on going and keep playing through multiple hand traps no matter what they drop at you. So, with that out of the way, we're going to dive headfirst into profile. I'm going to show you what we've got and explain why we've got it. So, very standard lineup on the Dark World cards themselves. Very rarely does it change from Free Rainbow, Genta, and Snows, alongside the Double Greffa. And then I'm still playing one Silver and one Cerulee. Now, I know a lot of people like to change the ratios on these ones. That is entirely up to you. The way that I've seen it and the way that I say it outright is generally, if you don't get to go first, Cerulee is still slightly effective for you, but Silver isn't so effective for you. Like if your opponent only has one card in the hand, Silver cannot loop it back. For your opponent to still have two cards in the hand and then Cerulee to be effective for Silver to rip those two cards from their hand, it means that you need to go through a certain line of play and it means you have to have gone through certain interactions where the chances are your opponent might have dropped those cards in the hand if they were of effect to them. So you're really just kind of going as a bit more of a win more option if you're going second. However, going first, this is one of your best win cons, which is why I feel that if you are going first and you know they're not playing D-Shift or anything like that, you'll side in a second Cerulee to help you get the job done. Other than that, you kind of get to these throughout your combo when you want them, and that's then going to give you the ability to slowly start chipping away at your opponent's hand, and ideally you're leaving them with one card in the hand, drawing into the second card, or you're taking all of their cards from their hand completely when you use Triple Tactic Talents as well, and you've also got the knowledge of whatever they had. So if you get to activate Triple Tactic Talents early in the combo, you see what they have, you put back their strongest card and then you continue to just rip away. So it's something that I didn't want to lean into because the deck can just naturally get to it when it wants to and when it does that it still has the fallback of all of the fusion monsters. When you're looking at stuff like your Desiree, you're looking at stuff like your Dark World Greffa fusion monster, you've already got everything you need and that's why I'm also still playing Colorless in the extra deck because I feel that that gives you the aggressive alternative because we are still able to utilize the Saga the Destroyer with a lot more consistency because we do also play the Fiendsmith engine to help you get to the Aerial Eater which will allow you to pretty much send the Visago to the graveyard and the reason that is useful is Visago can act as the original rainbow for your Colorless or it can act as the original Greffa for your Greffa fusion monster. So you're basically getting the best of both on, on, on that kind of front. Not only that but it can also be attributed or treated as any fusion material. So it can also be utilized to get you into your Fiendsmith Desiree if you wanted to. So it kind of has multiple purposes. And then with all my Dark World builds, my main deck normal summon is still Quacky Mirror Guardian. Yes, of course, you very easily sub this out for Lava Golem. That's the best swap in my opinion because you know, right, okay, I'm going second. My opponent's pretty much setting up Omni Negate boards. I can just give them a Lava Golem and continue to play. However, I still feel that Quacky Mirror Guardian of all of the normal summons that you can consider for a Dark World deck is the best and most balanced for going first and second. 
Go in first, you go draw, standby, main, drop the Quacky Mirror Guardian. Straight away, that means if they try to activate a second Chummy on you, you can hit them with a Quacky Mirror Guardian. If they try and hit you with a Dryon Lockbird, you hit them with a Quacky Mirror Guardian. Whereas when you're looking at stuff like Ken and Gen, the only benefit of Ken or Gen is the fact that they put a monster on your opponent's board, which will then set up your talents and thrust and everything else, and turn off an Imperm. However, if they already have an Imperm, they're probably going to use it on the Ken or Gen that you normal summon early doors. It still means that an Imperm will still disrupt the Quacky Mirror Guardian, but it then means your opponent has to have an Imperm and another Hand Trap to really, really stop you. Now, a lot of people also said, what do you do with this during the end phase if it's going to self-destruct? Well, very simply, if you haven't drawn into a second Quacky Mirror Guardian, you use this as one of your last link-off fodders, and then you use it to link off when you've already got the Gref Fusion set up, as that will then be your protective replacement in order to deal with a card like Nibiru or anything else that your Quacky Mirror Guardian was already protecting you for. And by the time you get to your end of your turn, your Quacky Mirror Guardian has served its purpose of being that negate for a Drawn Lockbird if you are worried about it. And even then, like I said, if you haven't drawn a second copy of it that's when you link it off but if you have drawn a second copy of it because you've burnt through your dangers and everything else in between you just leave it on the board and it acts as another form of interruption for your opponent's turn which a lot of people will not be expecting or, or even predicting then for the dangers, we are playing Triple Danger Nessie to lead you into Double Mothman. You can very easily play Free Mothman if you wanted to. Uh, I don't play Card Destruction in this particular version because depending on the ver uh, variant that you're going to, activating Card Destruction can actually help your opponent sometimes. You do need to be a little bit careful, which is why the secondary effect of Mothman can be a tad bit risky. But I still like playing the ratios of 3 and 2, followed up by the 1 Chubacabra, the 1 Bigfoot, and the 1 Jackalope. And then of course the controlled uh, danger in the form of the Zalamander uh, Catalyzer. Now a lot of people question this card. I think this is one of the first danger s cards that goes into the deck because it allows you to control what you discard. The danger is all going to be RNG. Yes, it does draw and replace itself, but the Zalamander Catalyzer gives you that ability to go, okay, you know what? I want to summon this to the board as a level four, but then I want to discard my snow, and then my snow is going to be discarded via card effect, so I then get to replace it by searching out a card. So it does exactly what the danger does, just without that randomized RNG factor. Uh, and then moving on to the Fiendsmith engine, we are playing two engravers followed up by the single Lacrima and of course the one Lorry. Now you might not need to worry about Lorry as much, but it's still kind of a really cool option just to be able to go, okay, well I've hard opened up Tract, I activate Tract, I can search out any of these cards, but ideally if I search out the Lorry, I can add the Lorry, discard the Lorry, trigger the effect and off we go from there. It is a 41 card deck, so Lorry could probably be one of the first ones you could consider cutting, just because what makes the Engraver or the Fiendsmith engine so good with the deck is of course the Fiendsmith Tract. So the best thing about the Fiendsmith Tract is it lets you add a Light Fiend, which of course you have access to an Engraver which can search you out another Tract, which means you just have more hand advantage to keep going. Or of course you search out a Lorry and then you can go, you know what, I'll just discard a Dark World instead, because that Dark World will get me more advantage. And that's the benefit of Tract being able to discard as effect, is it will allow you to trigger all your Dark World cards, which can be great for going first or second, depending on what you have in the hand. If you're going second, you discard a Greffy, you get to pop a card or try and out one of the interactions that your opponent might have built up on the board. And if you're going first, of course, you get to search out, or search out a Lorry, which will help you get your combo off. Or if you've already got Lorry in rotation, you search out an Engraver. That will then give you the ability to discard a Dark World, which will then allow you to interact with your opponent or just search out what you need. And then, of course, you can go Engraver, search out a second Tract, not that you're going to be able to activate that second tract, but it pretty much gets you in the positions that you want to be with all of the pieces in the graveyard, on in the hand, and just more advantage for your discard for your uh, dangers. Moving on to the Dark World cards, I'm playing two Gate of the Dark World, pretty standard in all of my builds that I do. Uh, one Accession, and then the one Archives. Again, Archives is one of the ones that some people don't like. Personally, I think it's a really kind of cool card with the right setup. On its own, not so great, but if you're able to get that discard effect off of the back of a dark one and then being able to draw and discard all in one effect is amazing because you get to refresh your hand a little bit, you get to trigger off a dark world, and of course if you're going second you get to get a nice little attack buff on most of your fiend monsters. Uh, and then of course because we do have that ability to trigger up Frost whenever we want it, we're going to be able to do this by giving our opponent a Cerulee, which can then lead us into two targets in the form of the Corridor and the Talons. Now again, comes down to personal preference, you might want to consider bumping these up, putting them down, but what I do like about the idea of main deck in Frost is again it gives you that ability that when you start going into your side deck, it can give you direct access to any Floodgate card that will cause your opponent an issue. And that's what I mean when they try and go Moltrum you and you go, okay cool, I can play around this, so I'll just go down, I'll actually get my Greffa to the graveyard, bring the Greffa back from the graveyard. I haven't really triggered the Flory, um, the Floros kind of draw ability. Uh, activate Frost because they've activated that. Set Eradicator, pass, flip Eradicator, call spells, call traps, get rid of it. 
Of course, you do have other virus cards that you could look for depending on the type of environment you're going to. You can also consider stuff like D-Barrier, which can be a massive out. You can consider DDG, as most of the discarding effects are gonna be happening during your turn. So if you flip a DDG, so different dimension grounds during your opponent's turn, that will then obviously, of course, only affect them one way, and that can be quite damaging. So the Thrust will activate as, or act as two different options for you, and definitely if you're gonna be considering some more board breakers in your extra deck, you might, uh, sorry, side deck, you might wanna look at stuff like Lightning Storms, Dusters, everything else in between in there it gives you that ability for frost to be that bridge to get you either your combo starters your board breakers or your floodgate-esque normal trap cards so it gives you everything you need to which is why you want to be playing it you could play it free if you wanted to but honestly i feel two is more than enough because at this exact moment in time frost is basically acting as additional copies of talents corridor and tracked without clogging the deck down so it's one of the ones where it goes okay cool i see corridor in my hand excellent i've also got frost so frost can now be talents or tracked or i've already seen tracked my uh, Frost can then give me a Talents in a Corridor. So you're just basically adding more copies without it clogging the deck down. Because if you open up a, two Talents, you can only use one of them. The second one's a brick. Same with the Corridor. If you open up two Corridor, one's a brick, one's not. So rather than playing a second of each of these, I play two Frost because then they can become those if I wanted to. So it's just giving you a range of options. Uh, and I feel that's the best way to play the deck like this. Moving on to the extra deck. So for the extra deck, we are playing, of course, the Greffa Dragon Overlord. So this is your defensive fusion option. And the ways you get this is through a session, but you also get it through the Fiendsmith Secrets, which can be quite helpful to recycle those materials. I'm also playing the one colorless, and like I've already said, the way that you can make colorless is this is where your Asago the Destroyer is going to come into play, because that's the one that can basically sub itself out to be any of the named materials on this. So it can also be subbed out for Desiree, because on the Desiree it can actually count itself as Fiendsmith Engraver, which is really important. So you've got your Asago the Destroyer that can kind of count off for any of these that you might need in order to complete the fusion summon successfully. Of course you do play the one Aerial Eater. Now with Aerial Eater, because it requires two theme monsters with the same attribute, this is something that sometimes you're gonna need to utilize your sequence to do so. And the reason that you do that is because you can also use Visago as it is a fiend with your accession. So if you're going second and you're like, all right, I really wanna make colorless to nuke the board up, you'd actually go through your sequence play to get you into the Aerial Eater. The Aerial Eater will send the Visago. And then of course you'd work your way into the accession through snow and everything else. Activate the accession, banishing the Visago that will then of course be colorless, uh, sorry, original rainbow, which will allow you to summon out colorless with as many of the dark uh, two or more fiend monsters from the graveyard as well. And then you get to go and call nuke the board. You can consider putting in a very small unchained package in this. And that's when you consider Yama. And that's when you can also consider the, um, the red dog in the main deck as well. And of course you can consider rage. Honestly, I didn't think it needed it. It's just one of them additional options that you can consider. And the best thing about Aerial Eater is it's actually a lot easier to summon back from the graveyard in this particular build, just because you play so many fiends that are a level six or higher, it's very easy to do. Uh, and then carrying on with, we'll go with the non-link monsters first. We play the one, the Geres. Obviously, being able to draw and then discard as effect is just going to be able to trigger your Dark Words, which is absolutely insane. We've got the one Chaos Angel, as you do have a very nice mix of levels and, of course, attributes with the Fiendsmiths all being the lights and then your Dark Worlds all being the dark. So the fact of the matter is you've got an Engraver, which is a six light. And then, of course, you have stuff like your Genta and your Snow, which is your four darks. Then on the flip side to that as well, you do also have, once I find it, you have your Lacrima, wherever she may be hiding. Your Lacrima, which will be your level four light. And then for your level six dark, uh, or you'd actually need to adapt a little bit more, but you do obviously have your dangers that can also be considered as your level four darks as well. So the Lacrima light is probably gonna be more so engraver with Mothman, but keep in mind you have other ways to do this because this requires um, one or more non-tuners. So you can just try to um, uh, add up the levels to get you into a Chaos Angel. It doesn't always need to be made with a light and a dark. Obviously with a light, your synchro monsters are unaffected, which of course would be Chaos Angel. But if you make it with darks, it just means all of your monsters can't be destroyed by battle. So they can't just run over any of your monsters and you're gonna make it very difficult for them to try and break your board. And then for the Link Monsters, of course, we're playing the one Requiem. This gets you into your Lacrima. Lacrima will then of course send the Engraver and you're basically like setting up all the plays you need to. Uh, sequence. Muckraker, so Muckraker is of course the bridge between two of both of these because Muckraker has the ability to bring back any of your Fiendsmiths while also having the ability to discard a Dark World as effect, which will trigger the effect and go from there. And just as a little bit of a preview, I have brought back the Zelantis Lock, which I'll explain to you a little bit later on when I get to Zelantis. Of course, you've got your IP Masquerina into SP Little Knight. You play Moon of the Closed Heavens just because you use that as the bridge to get you into your Fiendsmith engine if you don't see any of the Fiendsmith engine as you're working your way through the Dark World plays. 
We've got the one Akasic Magician. What I like about this is it allows you to bounce. So it's two monsters with the same type and attribute, except, um, sorry, same type, which is very easy because obviously you've got your Fiendsmiths, which are Fiends, but Lights, which is fine. And then of course you've got your Dark Worlds, which are your Dark Fiends. So you've got loads of different ways to make the Akashic Magician. And the best thing about this is you get to bounce the Cerruti, give your opponents, so you can use it again. And you can also bounce a Danger back to your hand, which then allows you to mean that you've got another way to discard that Cerruti. Uh, one that's Saruja Skulldred. Of course, you do have flexibility in the extra deck. Skulldred is still incredibly good for the deck in general. But then, of course, with Akashi Magician, you do have stuff like Security Dragon, which is another option. I'm personally a big fan of Akashi because it doesn't target, which is really, really helpful as well. Uh, and then, of course, you do have other different options to work your way into an Axis Code Talk if you want to. But honestly, I don't think the deck needs it. You could look at some Rank 8 if you want to. But again, I don't think the deck needs it. And then the last card that I'm playing is the Zelantis, and what I really like about the Zelantis, as I've used it before, is that when you use Muttraker to discard a card, uh, it locks you into Fiends for that turn. So the idea is you make Skulldred, then you make Muttraker underneath Skulldred, and then you turn your Skulldred into Zelantis. So I had to go in the tie and go to the side, it doesn't make any difference. But the idea is that once you've done this play, that's when you activate the uh, Muttraker's effect, where you discard one of your target a Dark World in the graveyard, revive that Dark World, discard a Dark World as effect. And this now Fiend locks you. Then what you're going to be doing is hopefully the, theme, the Dark World you've discarded is something like Silver, so it brings another body back to the board. That's when you start bringing back your lowest attack Fiend monsters back to the hand to regain the resource. So if you've got a Rainbow in the graveyard, for example, you'll go, okay, cool, return the Silver to the hand, return the Snow that you've just summoned back off of the Muttraker back to the hand. You've now got a Muttraker, a Zelantis, a Rainbow, and a... Graffer on the board, right? So that's very aggressive. But let's say your opponent has all their monsters in defense. You go, okay, not an issue. Activate Zelantis, attempt to banish the entire board. Now, because you are specifically themed locked, it won't allow you to bring back any monsters because you are the person bringing back the monsters to yours and your opponent's board. So if they're not playing Fiends, you will not be able to bring them back to your opponent's board. So what you're basically doing is you're trading your Zelantis, as you won't be able to bring it back as your Fiend locked, for their entire board. So your board then gets recurred to being a Muttraker plus your Rainbow plus the Greffer. And then if that wasn't enough, if you do have more cards that can discard, remember you can still reveal the dangers to discard even though they cannot summon because the idea would be you go, okay, cool, well, I've got my Silver in my hand, I've got the Snow in the hand, I'm going to reveal this Jackalope. I don't hit the Jackalope, but I hit the Silver. Great, Silver comes back to the board. So straight away, you've now got a Rainbow at 3k, you've got a Greffer at 2.7, you've got a Silver at 2.3, and then you've got a Muttraker at 1,000. And that's before you even consider the Dark World Field spell. If you hit the Snow that you've recycled back to the hand, great, you just go for a session, you go for Archives, you can go for anything that is Dark World searchable, and then that can help you extend your plays even further forward, and you're basically going to be swinging in for an OTK with an empty board. So it's a really kind of cool combo. I do like it. It does catch a huge amount of people off guard. Uh, there's a lot of times where I do it and then they're trying to bring their cards back and I go, yeah, you can't bring them back because I'm actually fiend locked, so I can't bring them back for you. So I thought it was like a really kind of cool option. Killing one as well. Uh, even if you're fiend locked, you can still make Chaos Angel. It is a fiend. So uh, it's very, very funny if you just keep getting different levels back or you keep getting able to extend your board and you just go, cool, add a Chaos Angel to this board as well, banish a back row. Not that that back row is going to be much use because if it survived that entire point, uh, it's probably not going to be that effective for them. But that's pretty much it for the list. Like I said, I've tried to make this as competitive as possible, which does mean budget goes out the window, but the deck is still very, very powerful. Yes, there are hand traps in this format that will stop the deck cold, uh, and that's unfortunately why Dark World is not the top tier or tier zero meta or anything like that. However, the deck is still incredibly fun, and if you sleep on it, you will get punished by it. Uh, and it is just one of them ones where you start need to use in a bit of common sense. If you're going to an environment that everyone's on Tempai, for example, and you're expecting Tempai to be playing Fluoros, um, Perulia, plus Shifter, you go, right, okay, well, I'm going to main deck cross out. But if you're going to an event where you're like, mm, I could place that Shifter deck, but I could also face a deck that doesn't like Shifter, you kind of roll the dice with it. And if it does turn out that they're playing Shifter, you go, right, okay, here's where my side deck comes into play. You play free cross out, maybe you play one of each of the Fluorosses, or maybe you play uh, free Fluoros, free cross out, one Shifter, plus you then play generic back row hate, so Cosmic Cyclone or um, Harpy's Feather Duster and Lightning Storm, and then you add in searchable floodgates you can get off of Frost. So stuff like DDG, as I've already mentioned, you've got the Eradicator virus. You can also go down the route of just a D barrier because that can stop Tempai in its tracks very painfully. And you just have so many different options that you can kind of search and set up that it allows you to kind of shrink down the pool to get you a range of powerful cards rather than having to max out on freeze of absolutely everything. And then you counter side to what you feel you might be getting if you feel that you are going to be massively disadvantaged should a Drawn Lockbird go in your opponent's deck. You need to make sure that you don't get stopped cold. 
Onis Field drawing lock bird is probably one of the least hand traps to be worrying about right now, just because some people will play it, some people won't. And then of course you do have your natural ability of the Koki Muru Guardian to deal with that. And what you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be able to go, okay, cool, I'm going second, give them a lava golem and they go droll. Like that's the only point where it becomes a little bit of an issue. Um, but you, again, you just need to kind of assess the situation, assess the environment you're going to and then adapt and overcome. Anyway, that is it for the entire Dark World profile. If you don't have any questions at all, by all means, please put them in the comments down below. This is not the stone in the wall build. Like, you don't have to play this build card for card. I'm just giving you the option that has worked best for me right now in this current meta, and that's just going all out gas, ripping my opponent's hand game one, game two, just out aggressive, uh, more aggression than them, uh, and then using a bit of common sense to counter side to what I feel the environment is going to throw my way um, after matchup number one. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share. Till next time, as absolutely always, stay safe, and of course, happy dueling.